Thank you all for being here. Last panel of the day. Uh, we're going to mix it up a little bit here. Um, my name is Rick Banks. I'm from Stanford Law School. We're happy to have with us uh, the three panelists who will have only this introduction. Uh, Doug and Jane on my left, on the far left, uh, from UC Irvine. Melissa Murray uh, from across the bay at UC Berkeley. And Michael Rosenfeld, who joins us from San Francisco. And the, in the, from the Stanford Sociology Department as well. OK. Uh, so um, this is a uh, sort of punctuation to the conference. So most of the focus today has been uh, what we might call pro-marriage. Right? I mean, this is in the, in the wake of these uh, uh, victories uh, for marriage equality. Uh, but here we want to take a turn uh, and actually question uh, some of the assumptions on which some of the earlier discussion has been based uh, and ask uh, and investigate ask questions about alternatives to marriage uh, and put into question implicitly uh, the focus or the continued centrality of marriage uh, in these debates uh, about how the government regulates people's lives. So to start with, uh, we're going to have Doug and Jane, uh, then Melissa Murray, uh, and then Michael Rosenfeld will respond, uh, and then I'll have some questions for them. We'll have questions for the audience. We want to try to have this be very uh, active uh, or rather interactive. Uh, as we are closing out the uh, conference. So, Doug? So I want to I wanna first just thank Jane for inviting me and congratulate, I guess, since we're on the last panel, um, Jane and Gary for a, just a really wonderful conference. Um, and congratulate all of you to making it to the last panel. Um, and I also wanted to thank um, Rick for uh, organizing and moderating us, and Michael for reading my overlong paper. Um, and also just say it's um, a real pleasure to be on this panel with Melissa, because we've had so many discussions about these topics. And so to get the, to have it here is really um, fun for me. Um, given our objectives today, um, it's helpful to think about my project as um, shedding light both on the marriage debate on the left um, and the viability of alternatives to marriage. Um, so in some ways, we heard some from Lee yesterday uh, about the uh, uh, take up of these alternatives to marriage. And so maybe it's um, coming full circle back to that discussion we had yesterday. Uh, so advocates have uh, embraced marriage, but this wasn't always the case. Um, as Jane and others reminded us, um, before the Hawaii Supreme Court's uh, 1993 Bear decision, uh, advocates debated whether the movement should pursue marriage at all, and prominent activists um, sought to resist marriage as a model of family recognition and sexual regulation. And critics of the current movement's uh, devotion to marriage articulate some of these same objections. Um, some suggest that had advocates remained committed to the earlier vision um, of marriage resistance, the current landscape would look different. Um, marriage might matter less for family-based rights and responsibilities, um, and for the social meaning of our relationships. And these scholars emphasize the dimensions of the LGBT movement that rejected marriage, and they frame work to some extent in the 1980s and early 1990s um, as a successful push against marriage uh, and toward family pluralism and sexual liberty. Um, Non-marital recognition, and specifically domestic partnership, um, was pushing against rather than towards claims to marriage. Uh, under this view, the mid-1990s um, uh, marked a strikingly normative, more than strategic, shift in LGBT work. And so in this project, I challenged some of the assumptions that structure that internal left debate by revisiting the earlier era on which um, some of today's critical assessments often rest, um, trying to un uh, uncover marriage's role um, and indeed marriage's centrality even before marriage became a formal part of the LGBT movement's agenda. Uh, so through a case study of, and because I'm now <coughs> short in my presentation, we're skipping some slides, um, through a case study of California-based advocacy on behalf of non-marital relationships, namely domestic partnerships, um, I show that in the 1980s and early 1990s, before Bayer and the marriage that would follow, uh, marriage shaped non-marital recognition, um, and conversely, non-marital recognition um, participated in the shaping of marriage. So what do I mean by marriage-shaped uh, non-marital recognition? Uh, first, advocates occupied a legal, political, and cultural framework that privileged marriage. Um, both before and after Bayer, marriage constructed claims to non-marital recognition, provided the norms that define domestic partnership, and limited the reach of non-marital statuses. Who could actually be included in those statuses and what kinds of relationships were covered? 
Um, same-sex couples were rendered marriage-like in order to gain non-marital support. And in fact, some same-sex couples welcomed marriage um, into um, their lives, invoking some marital tropes um, to understand domestic partnership. Uh, second, by selectively appropriating uh, marital norms to achieve non-marital recognition, advocates not only rendered same-sex couples marriage-like, but also in some ways participated in the changing meaning of marriage itself, um, appealing to marital norms to gain non-marital support, uh, advocates shaped marriage in directions that stressed adult romantic affiliation, mutual emotional support, and economic interdependence over gender differentiation, procreative sex, and biological male-female parenting. In some ways, um, as Kenji invoked earlier in the day, Justice Alito's consent-based version of marriage over the traditional conjugal-based uh, version of marriage. Um, so because of time, I'm going to focus just on a couple key moments in the California case study that I offer in the paper um, to illustrate what was happening. Uh, so early domestic partnership efforts um, included same-sex and different-sex couples, uh, but were linked both to marriage-like relationships and to sexual orientation non-discrimination. Um, in 1979, uh, Berkeley passed uh, sexual orientation non-discrimination ordinance. And in response, the following year, a city employee, Tom Brown, uh, sought health care coverage for his same-sex partner um, and suggested that the city create a domestic partnership designation. And after an unsuccessful uh, push for domestic partnership in San Francisco in 1982, the Berkeley Human Rights and Welfare Commission uh, held a public hearing on domestic partnership in 1983. And lesbian and gay community members showed that the marriage criterion for benefits discriminated based on sexual orientation. Later that year, the commission uh, recommended to the city council that it adopt a domestic partnership policy. And inc it included options both for a same-sex only policy and a policy that included same-sex and different <coughs> sex couples. Uh, in making the recommendation, the commission stressed that its role was to make the benefits system, quote, specifically more equal not generally better. Um, it suggested that the domestic partnership uh, policy, quote, approximate the current marriage criterion. It explained that even as it left open the option of including both same-sex and different-sex couples, it was, quote, rejecting the possibility of creating a new criterion which is substantially easier than the marriage criterion. The commission defined domestic partners as two people not related by blood, closer than would bar marriage, who reside together and share the common necessities of life and are responsible for each other's common welfare. The common necessities of life language was adapted from the common law duty placed on spouses. And in 1984, Berkeley adopted a policy including uh, within it employees same sex uh, or different sex partners. And some of you might have been following over the past couple weeks that there was a proposal to do away with the Berkeley domestic partnership policy, which I think brings into focus uh, a lot of the um, uh, interest that Melissa and I have in these non-marital alternatives. Uh, around the same time, advocates began to litigate for domestic partnership benefits at the state level. And when the California Department of Personnel Administration refused to provide dental benefits for the same-sex partner of Boyce Hinman, a state employee, Hinman sued and was represented by Roberta Actenberg, a leading LGBT rights lawyer who claimed sexual orientation, not marital status discrimination. Marriage framed Hinman's claim. Um, he and his partner represented in the briefs that they would marry if they were not prohibited from doing so by state law. And Actenberg stressed the couple's commonality with married couples. They share a home, combine their incomes and assets, and jointly own real estate and personal property, have friends together, a feeling of belonging together, looked upon by themselves and by friends and family as having a responsibility for each other. They're beneficiaries of each other's uh, wills and life insurance policies and have made mutual commitments of emotional support and legally enforceable commitments of economic support. This, of course, is a particular model of marriage, um, one rooted in adult affiliation, emotional support, and financial interdependence. Um, Actenberg also uh, distanced same-sex couples from different-sex unmarried couples. Uh, so she argued that many unmarried heterosexual couples do not take on the economic integration and permanent commitment manifested in Hinman's relationship and the relationship of married couples. This argument made a lot of sense in light of California case law, um, which at that point had denied unemployment benefits to unmarried different-sex partners. 
uh, in a case called Norman versus Unemployment Insurance Appeals Board, the California Supreme Court upheld the denial of employment benefits uh, to a woman who had left her job to accompany her fiance to another state, and in doing so relied on the uh, state's, quote, legitimate interest in promoting marriage. Accordingly, uh, advocates focused on um, sexual orientation discrimination in a regime organized around marriage. And the ACLU's amicus brief um, was submitted by Matt Coles, who helped draft the domestic partnership language in Berkeley and the failed language in San Francisco, who, as we all know, would go on to lead the LGBT rights project at the ACLU. Um, and he argued that the fight is not between those who do and those who do not receive the benefits. It's between those who may, if they wish, receive the benefits. Uh, and those who may not. Yet the court rejected the plaintiff's claim by grouping lesbians and gay men uh, with all other uh, unmarried individuals. Uh, homosexuals are simply part of the larger class of unmarried persons to which also belong employees, filial relations, and parents. Um, even as the marriage-like nature of Hinman's relationship formed the basis of his claim, his exclusion from marriage rendered him and his partner uh, more like spouses, uh, more like siblings than spouses, um, and therefore ineligible for benefits. The court actually explained that without doing so explicitly, uh, Hinman was challenging the state's marriage law. Domestic partnership began to spread in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, in 1990, voters in San Francisco passed domestic partnership uh, for same-sex and different-sex couples. Um, of course, they had the previous year voted against domestic partnership. Hard to us to imagine a time when San Francisco voters would vote against domestic partnership. Um, on the first day that couples registered Valentine's Day 1991, uh, the scene mirrored many of marriage's ceremonial elements. Uh, in 1993, Los Angeles uh, passed domestic partnership for city workers. Um, the city, uh, unlike some of what was happening in San Francisco at the time, had struggled to find willing insurance carriers. Uh, which grouped unmarried couples with other relationships excluded from coverage. Uh, in San Francisco, officials had responded to insurers' concerns by agreeing to um, set the rules of what a domestic partner is, quote, so close to a spouse that insurers don't really expand their risk very much, according to a task force report. Um, while in Los Angeles, union leaders tried repeatedly to convince insurers by arguing that including domestic partners um, would, quote, be consistent with the traditional focus on the nuclear family and wouldn't require extending coverage further to include a subscriber's parents, for example. Uh, as these efforts were moving forward, Hawaii hits. Um, and it sparks powerful counter-mobilization illustrated by the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. State Defense of Marriage Acts, including the state DOMAs, um, rather than put up something so depressing as all those domas that put up a picture of Hawaii. Um, uh, and uh, the LGBT movement itself also started to mobilize more around uh, marriage. Uh, in California in 1994, a domestic partnership bill was introduced um, that included same-sex and different-sex couples. It was passed by the legislature, but vetoed by Governor Wilson. It defined domestic partners as two adults who have chosen to share one another's lives in an intimate and committed relationship of mutual caring. Uh, as the 1990s closed, California enacted its first domestic partnership law. Um, Assemblywoman Carol Midgin attempted to include both same-sex and different-sex couples. But Governor Gray Davis wouldn't support a bill that included different-sex couples uh, because it threatened to minimize the importance for marriage. Uh, for everyone else, his chief of staff said, there's another process, and it's called marriage. Um, ultimately, they reached a compromise, including different sex couples over 62. Now that's only one member over 62. At the time, it was both over 62. And from there, the domestic partnership law was built up to the one that we saw at issue in uh, Perry. So how should this case study um, impact how we understand the trajectory of marriage and LGBT advocacy uh, and how we approach the marriage debate on the left? Uh, and more specifically for our purposes on this panel, what does this case study reveal about the um, impact and viability of non-marital recognition regimes? Um, for most people in this room, I think the marriage debate on the left is familiar to them. So I'm going to move to what some of the lessons um, would be. Um, first, the case study exposes the regulatory uh, reach and legal and cultural weight of marriage. Uh, in the 1980s and early 1990s, the force of marriage channeled family diversity advocacy into work aimed at intimate couples, um, even if that included both different sex and same-sex couples. 
But marriage's continued position as the ideal both limited reform for those who could marry, different sex couples, and constructed marriage as the basis of comparison for those excluded from marriage, same-sex couples. Advocates did not and could not simply reject marriage. Instead, they challenged marriage's role at the same time that they accepted the power of marital norms. Um, this suggests the difficulty with some prescriptive claims urging the turn away from marriage. Um, even at this uh, early point, advocates had to tailor domestic partnerships terms and reach to marriage. Second, the case study uh, reveals the elements of the LGBT movement that took a more affirmative and, and often uh, more variable stance toward marriage. Um, advocates didn't accommodate marriage's power simply because of forces outside the movement. Rather, they acted on behalf of constituents who valued marriage or elements of marriage in particular ways. And advocates themselves, to some extent, envisioned a state marriage regime that included same-sex couples. Uh, this also sheds light, I think, on where we are right now in terms of the case for marriage. Um, the account reveals really the trajectory of the case for marriage and its um, uh, foundation in the pre-bear years. Uh, I th we underestimate the distinctive LGBT contributions to marriage occurring through work outside of marriage and before marriage occupied a formal place on the agenda. Um, as the California case study reveals, same-sex couples became appropriate uh, subjects of recognition to the extent they resembled married couples. So how we imagined and understood married couples was important. If same-sex couples deserved recognition because they functioned like married couples, the way in which they did, um, providing a vehicle for romantic affiliation, mutual support, economic interdependence, uh, became important to the very uh, meaning of marriage. In casting same-sex couples as marriage-like, for the purpose of securing non-marital rights, advocates ultimately constructed uh, marriage itself as LGBT inclusive. And I think contemporary marriage equality jurisprudence bears this out to a significant degree. Uh, the arguments through which advocates achieved non-marital recognition support their arguments for marriage, and non-marital recognition regimes, like domestic partnership in California, divest uh, marriage laws of rationales previously understood to justify the exclusion of same-sex couples. The district court in Perry, for instance, articulated a model of marriage based on some of the expert testimony that Kenji discussed that looks very much like non-marital recognition. Marriage is the state recognition and approval of a couple's choice to live with each other, to remain committed to one another, and to form a household based on their own feelings about one another, and to join in an economic partnership of support one another and any dependents. Um, this looks not only like the consent-based view of marriage that Justice Alito takes in dissent in Windsor, but also like domestic partnership in its earliest articulations um, in cities in uh, California in the 1980s. So I look forward to the discussion um, and uh, the Q&A on um, whether this sheds any light on if we have a future for non-marital alternatives. Thanks. Thank you to Gary and to Jane for inviting me, and to Rick, Michael, and Doug for a chance to talk about these issues together. Um, 2013 has obviously been an important year for marriage equality, but even before the Supreme Court announced its decisions in Windsor and Perry, 2013 had already presented us with a number of important opportunities to reflect on issues of liberty and equality that underwrite the marriage equality movement. This year, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of Roe versus Wade and the 10th anniversary of Lawrence versus Texas. We also marked the 10th anniversary of Goodrich, which began the process of incrementally cobbling together a patchwork of states that offered same-sex couples access to marriage. But even as we celebrated these anniversaries, we overlooked another. 2013 also marks 10 years since California enacted the California Domestic Partnerships Rights and Responsibilities Act expanding the state's domestic partnership scheme to provide same-sex couples with virtually all of the privileges and responsibilities of marriage under state law. Now, this panel asks us to consider the fate of alternative statuses like domestic partnership after Windsor and Perry. And in the wake of these decisions, can something like domestic partnership survive and flourish as a credible alternative to marriage? On the one hand, after Windsor and Perry, I'm a little pessimistic about the prospect of alternatives for relationship recognition. Throughout the Perry litigation, California's domestic partnership scheme, which provided same-sex couples with virtually everything that marriage provided under state law, 
but did so under a different rubric, was viewed as a cut-rate marriage substitute, a glaring badge of inferiority that consigned same-sex couples to second-class citizenship. And rightly so. It was clear that these were marriages in all but name, and in doing so, it clearly denied gay couples access to the marriage label and all of the symbolism and cultural freight that that label carried. Windsor, of course, did not invoke the image of domestic partnerships explicitly, but its florid discussion of marriage and that institution's importance in reflecting a couple's commitment to one another and communicating state approval and recognition of that commitment made clear that domestic partnerships simply do not cut it. Gay men and women had to have access to marriage, not simply access to a marriage counterfeit. However, I am more optimistic about the prospects of relationship recognition when I think about how domestic partnerships evolved and from what they evolved in, into. Now, if we focus on the end product, the 2005 California Domestic Partnership Act, um, 2003 California Domestic Partnership Act, which was fully enacted in 2005, um, we might be pessimistic. That's the end point. But if we go all the way back, as Doug suggested in his presentation, to the beginning, to the origins of domestic partnership, I think there is more room for guarded optimism about the prospect of marriage alternatives in the future. And so I want to put aside the domestic partnership regime that we've come to know and instead think about the origins of this alternative status. As Doug told you, domestic partnerships, which are now regarded as an injury inflicted upon same-sex couples, had a very different origin story. In 1984, when the city of Berkeley established the first municipal domestic partnership scheme, domestic partnership was not necessarily an injury, but rather an innovation. Specifically, it was understood as a means of remedying the pervasive workplace discrimination that occurred because married employees could share their employee health benefits with their spouses and families, and unmarried employees could not. In those early moments, domestic partnership was not a separate but equal marriage-like status available only to same-sex couples. Indeed, it was decidedly unlike marriage in that it offered only a very limited set of rights and benefits, and it was available to all unmarried couples, whether gay or straight. In this way, domestic partnership was considered by many to be an alternative to marriage for the purposes of relationship recognition. It was a way of securing limited governmental recognition and benefits for those who were either ineligible for civil marriage or who were chose to forego participation in the institution entirely. Now, as Doug warns, we should not be too rosy-eyed about these early efforts, and we should not view this period as a full-throated challenge to marriage's primacy. As he explains, efforts to craft municipal domestic partnership schemes were strongly informed by marriage and even by a desire on the part of some activists and advocates to lay a foundation for eventually securing access to civil marriage. Nevertheless, despite marriage's long shadow, these first-generation domestic partnerships were nonetheless understood as distinct from marriage, as less than marriage, and as such an alternative to marriage. And critically, there were those who believed that domestic partnership, because it was less than and unlike marriage, had the radical potential to go beyond simply legally recognizing non-marital couples, that it could provide recognition to non-traditional, non-conjugal relationships and kinship forms. And indeed, that impulse informed the creation of domestic partnership and civil union regimes in Madison, Wisconsin, and Washington, DC. So what changed in all of this? How did domestic partnerships go from being an innovation, a distinctive alternative to marriage for relationship recognition, to being an injurious facsimile of marriage? I've argued elsewhere that in California, domestic partnerships migration from the local level to the state level marks the beginning of a sea change in the way that this institution was understood. Critically, when domestic partnership migrated to the state level in the 1990s, it was no longer available to all unmarried couples. Instead, it was available only to same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples over the age of 62. And as Doug explained, California's embattled governor, Gray Davis, insisted on this change because he recognized that if domestic partnership was available to all unmarried couples, it would represent a challenge to marriage's primacy as the legal model for adult heterosexual relationships. Now, Davis's concern mirrored a broader debate within the LGBT community about what domestic partnership could and should be. As Jane observed yesterday, some viewed domestic partnership as a way of setting the stage for marriage equality by moving the status of same-sex couples incrementally closer to marriage. 
Others, however, clung to a more radical vision and argued that domestic partnership could be a true alternative to marriage and the foundation of a kind of family diversity model that would provide relationship recognition to those who are not part of a romantic dyad. Ultimately, as we know, the incremental model prevailed, and over time, additional rights and benefits were added piecemeal to the domestic partnership scheme, making it seem increasingly marriage-like. And the apotheosis of all of this came in 2003, when California passed the California Domestic Partnership Rights and Responsibilities Act, which made clear that going forward, domestic partners would have virtually all of the rights and responsibilities of marriage, and that domestic partnership would be regarded for purposes of state law as equivalent to marriage in all but name. Now, of course, by the time the law actually took effect in 2005, a separate but equal status for same-sex couples held little allure. In 2003, Massachusetts legalized same-sex marriage, and more particularly, it noted that providing all of marriage's substance in a differently named status was its by itself a constitutional injury. In 2008, the California Supreme Court weighed in and echoed the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, concluding that the California Constitution made the right to marry available to same-sex couples, and domestic partnership, however comprehensive, was insufficient to meet this constitutional obligation. The history that I've said sketched suggests that over time, domestic partnership evolved into an institution that was rightly derided as a separate but equal institution that constituted an injury to LGBT couples. But as we consider what follows in the wake of Windsor and Perry, I hope we'll think about the municipal level domestic partnership model and some of the impulses that animate it. Indeed, I think these impulses point the way toward promising alternatives for relationship recognition and what I've called relationship recognition pluralism. Again, in their initial municipal level incarnations, domestic partnerships were consciously understood as being distinct from and indeed less than marriage. They were less than in terms of the benefits and rights that they conferred, and they were distinctively less than as a status when compared to marriage. They lacked the same stature and dignity as marriage, and today we think of that lack of status and dignity as an injury. But again, I want to suggest that the less than aspect of marriage can also have upsides. As I've discussed elsewhere, marriage has long served as a vehicle for state regulation of sex, sexuality, and relationships. And though marriage offers a broad range of rights, benefits, and entitlements, it also entails some measure of state oversight, discipline, and regulation. With this in mind, we might understand municipal domestic partnerships as introducing not only an alternative to marriage for relationship recognition, but perhaps also an alternative to marriage's model of relationship regulation. That is, through municipal domestic partnerships comes a much more limited set of rights and benefits but also a lesser degree of state oversight and regulation. So consider this comparison. When you go to Berkeley City Hall to register for a domestic partnership, a city domestic partnership, you don't have the same kind of pomp and circumstance that you have when you get married. However, when you terminate Berkeley's municipal domestic partnership, you don't require the judicial decree, spousal maintenance, and division of assets that typically accompanies divorce. The state's oversight and regulation of municipal domestic partnership is less robust in some ways than its regulation of marriage. And this point warrants some elaboration. Recall the 2003 law that provided registered domestic partners with virtually all of the rights and benefits of state-level marriage. Because existing depart domestic partnerships would automatically be converted into statuses subject to this new expanded legal treatment, the law's implementation was delayed for two years to allow the California Secretary of State to inform those in existing domestic partnerships of the pending changes. And as Lee Badgett mentioned yesterday, in the two years between the law's enactment and its implementation in 2005, there was a significant spike in the number of domestic partnership dissolutions. Lee speculated yesterday that the spike was likely related to a significant change in the domestic partnership law. I think that's exactly right, but I would actually go further and speculate more. We might also consider whether or not, for some existing domestic partners, a legal status that was marriage in all but name was simply patently <coughs> undesirable. For some, the allure of domestic partnership was that it was not marriage and that it did not purport to be like marriage. 
Though some couples may have been interested in access to employment benefits and hospital visitation privileges, they may not have been interested in access to all of the benefits, privileges, and obligations entailed in marriage. They may have welcomed hospital visitation, but not the prospect of treating their incomes and assets as community property. Though domestic partnership lacked benefits and stature, it also lacked the state's oversight and regulation that attended civil marriage. And for some, that less than marriage feature was strongly appealing. Over the course of the last two days, we have talked a lot about the inevitable legalization of same-sex marriage on a national scale. And when this happens, it will be an important step forward. But it will also offer us a tremendous opportunity to stop and reflect upon the prospect of alternatives to marriage. Instead of crafting alternative statuses as stand-ins for an inaccessible institution, the fact of marriage equality may provide us an opportunity to pivot and think about understanding alternative statuses and marriage itself as simply different choices that we might make in seeking state recognition for our relationships. Now, of course, the danger is that we may overlook the critical moment as we rush to embrace marriage equality. So consider the examples of Connecticut and Vermont. Upon legalizing same-sex marriage, both states phased out their civil union statuses, ensuring that marriage would be the only available option for relationship recognition. Likewise, when New York legalized same-sex marriage in 2011, some of the private companies that earlier had extended benefits to registered domestic partners announced that going forward, benefits would be available only to married spouses. Though the opportunity for a range of options for relationship recognition existed and was on the table, marriage's monopoly on legal recognition of adults' relationships was confirmed. Now, this brings us back to Perry, Windsor, and those early municipal-level domestic partnership regimes. Again, the city of Berkeley was the first to launch a municipal domestic partnership registry in 1984. And since then, amidst all of the changes and the rise of the state-level domestic partnership regime, Berkeley has persisted in offering its municipal domestic partnership registry with its limited set of rights and benefits. However, this September, Berkeley Councilman Daryl Moore proposed a resolution directing the city manager to close the registry on October 11th. And interestingly, Moore proposed declaring that day, October 11th, which is known as National Coming Out Day, as Marriage Equality Day. Moore's proposal was prompted by his strong sense that the domestic partnership registry had run its course and was now obsolete. As he explained, with the adoption of marriage equality in the state of California, we no longer need this. And on the 22nd anniversary of the registry being established, we are now able to officially close it in celebration of Marriage Equality Day. Now, interestingly, especially in light of the data that was presented yesterday about the low uptake of civil unions and domestic partnerships, Moore's proposal mobilized a considerable constituency within the Berkeley community. A number of Berkeley residents noted that the continued importance of domestic partnership was an important thing in the lives of individuals throughout the city of Berkeley, whether gay or straight. This was an alternative for those who were eligible for civil marriage, but for whatever reason, chose not to marry. In voting to dismiss the resolution, council member Chris Worthington observed, in our celebration of victory for the rights of the gay community, we cannot take away the rights of everyone else. Now, perhaps Worthington was wrong to frame it as a collision of gay rights versus the rights of other people. To my mind, it seems, the problem that was presented by Moore's proposal was simply the question of whether we believe that marriage is and should be the paradigm model for relationship recognition, or whether we are interested in using this post-Windsor and Perry moment to think seriously about the prospect of creating new paradigms for multiple forms of recognition. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm not sure that I'm entirely qualified to tackle all the legal questions, but what I 
what I thought I would do is do what I can do, which is um, a little bit of a social science perspective on this question about what is marriage, what are the other alternatives, what do they mean empirically, and I just want to offer a, a, a couple of ideas around this. So one is if you look up it, you know, marriage in the dictionary, it doesn't start with a legal definition, right? And this is something that, that I thought it would be worth reminding room full of people at the law school, which is that marriage is not just what the law defines, right? Marriage is what two people define about each other. It's a commitment between two people. And if you think about it that way, then domestic partnership and marriage are not as different as they seem to be in the law, which is not to diminish the real legal differences and rights differences between those two things, which are you know, worth fighting over. But from a social science, from a sociological perspective, they're more similar than we've been letting on. So that's one thing. If you go back to 19th century American history on marriage, you find that that the tradition that we have now, where you go down to City Hall and you, you sign a form and you get registered and there's some official document, that didn't exist in the early American Republic and colonial America. You married by, by pronouncing that you were married to this other person in front of a few witnesses. Then you were married. There wasn't any paperwork to do. And so, uh, you know, in some ways I think that you know, we live in a sort of legal bureaucratic world that you know, we have to sometimes look, beh look beyond the definitions. Okay? Marriage is what two people makes it. That's, that's one thing I want to say. Um, so the other thing is, you know, I, I run this um, nationally representative longitudinal study of couples that has a big oversample of people with same-sex partners. And I follow them over time. And I'm able to actually ask and answer some empirical questions about marriage and domestic partnership for same-sex couples, including what are the couple longevity ramifications of marriage and same-sex uh, and domestic partnership for same-sex couples. And, and you know, part of the reason I'm interested in this is because some of the early anti-gay marriage arguments basically made the argument that same-sex couples aren't as stable as heterosexual couples. Um, you find this in Posner's uh, Sex and Reason, for instance. Same-sex couples aren't as stable as heterosexual couples. Therefore, they're not, they don't have marriage-like relationships. Therefore, we shouldn't reward them with the rights and privileges of marriage. So, but of course, you know, he, there wasn't any data he was referring to. He was just kind of making that up, um, which, is, which is actually what a lot of, you know, um, uh, not just law professors. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't going to say that. But, but a lot of a lot of the a lot of the literature about uh, uh, gay people and same-sex marriage exists in kind of a uh, empirical data vacuum, which is welcome to some because the less data you have, the more stuff you can make up, um, which serves the interests of some, but not everybody. Um, so. One thing that I wanted to show you briefly, and I don't know if this is going to be entirely legible from the back of the room, is a, like a breakdown of what people in this data set said their relationship was. This is from 2009, and it's changed a little bit since 2009. We're following these people over time. But you know, of the 471 people who had a same-sex partner in this data set, you know, 94 of those people said they were married in 2009. But of those 94 people, only 30 were actually, you know, we asked them, where were you married? And, you know, what year and all that kind of stuff. Only 30 of those 94 people were married in a place where there was same-sex marriage. When they talk about marriage, they're talking about what it means to them. They're not talking about you know, the piece of paper. Okay, they're talking about, you know, we're married because we're married. We know what that means, right? It's not, uh, it's not something that the state grants to you. It's something that you grant to you. And um, you know, then there were people who said they're not married but have domestic partnership. Um, you know, some of those people, most of those people lived in places where the domestic partnership was granted, but some of them have moved someplace else. And this is true also of the people who were married. Some of those people were married in places and then, you know, lived someplace where that marriage wasn't recognized, right? They'd gone to Canada and got married and moved back to California, right? Are they married? Well, you know, I mean, the legal answer is no, you're not married in California at that time. You know, now they would be, I suppose. But, but um, uh, you know, the... The empirical question for me is, you know, do they feel like they're married? And the answer was, you know, yes, for most of them. That's number one. And the more interesting empirical question is, do they have the couple longevity that's associated with being married? Do they act as if they're married, right? Because that's, that's the interesting question for me. And, um, you know, I just wanted to uh, just mention that of all of the 
same-sex couples who had a formal union of any kind, at least in 2009, only 19% of them had marriages that were recognized in the state in which they lived. Um, a, a lot of these people had, uh, you know, and some of these people, not just from the data set, but people that I interviewed as well, they were people who'd been together for 20 years and had, you know, married in the 80s. Uh, and, you know, their marriage was something that was important to them, right? They were married, but it wasn't recognized by anybody else. But then again, as I said, if you look it up in Webster's, it doesn't talk about anybody else. It talks about commitment of two people. Um, one of the things that was surprising to me uh, about couple longevity and formal unions in this data was that couple longevity wasn't, didn't turn out to be a function of whether you had a formal union that was recognized by the state or not. Right? It didn't matter whether you lived in a state that recognized your formal union or not. It just mattered whether you thought you were married or not. And so, so in terms of the empirical data, all the people with formal unions behave the same way. And all the people without formal unions, they behave the same way. And what I want to show you is, this is the sort of year-to-year uh, -year breakup rate of people in the data set. So uh, people who start relationships, you know, at relationship time zero, in the first year, you have about a 60% chance of breaking up with whoever you just met, right? No matter how great they seem at the time. <laughs> um, you know, in the early stages, those things don't always work. But what happens is, over time, Right? You sort of invest more in this relationship, and then the year-to-year -year breakup rate gets driven down. And the other thing I want to point out to you is that um, the same-sex couples and the heterosexual couples have the same pattern of breakup rate. They're just as um, uh, prone to break up if they don't have a formal union, and they're just as stable with formal unions. And the, although there is a difference in couple longevity between heterosexual couples and same-sex couples, the difference is entirely explained by the marriage rate, okay? 78% of heterosexual couples in the United States are married. Among same-sex couples, it's more like 32%. And when I say 32%, I mean any kind of formal union, okay? Say you're married, have a domestic partnership, are married, you know, we're married in Canada, moved to California, we're married in California, and it's recognized, let's say, regardless, because for the purposes of couple longevity, those things are all the same. So, so one of the things that was interesting to me is that there isn't a difference between formal unions in terms of couple longevity about whether they're, it's, it's recognized by the state. And the second thing is that heterosexual couples and same-sex couples have the same pattern of couple longevity. There's no statistical difference between them. The only difference is the, is the rate of marriage. One of the things that's interesting to me is whether when we have you know, legal same-sex marriage in the United States and we've had a generation of people who grew up knowing that that was available to them, whether the marriage rate of same-sex couples will eventually be the same as the marriage rate of heterosexual couples. And I'm not saying that it should be, or that would be what we, you know, what everybody necessarily would want. But that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. The marriage rate of heterosexuals has been steadily declining over time. So we have a sort of greater diversity in heterosexual families in the United States than we've ever had. Some of it is, it is displacement by less, by unions that have less, um, Commitment, the sort of cohabiting unions where there isn't any formality to it. So the, the last thing I want to leave you with is, is uh, what, what the literature people call the marriage plot. Right? I mean, if you, if you follow movies, if you follow 19th century literature, everything, you know, if it's not a tragedy, right, it ends in marriage, right? That's the only way it can end. <laughs> and, um, you know, one of the things that's interesting. One of the things that's interesting about sort of the romantic comedies, this is something my students were pointing out to me yesterday. One of the things that's interesting about the romantic comedies of today is that they don't end in a marriage ceremony, okay? But they do still end with commitment, right? They do still end with people together, and it's still the same marriage plot. It doesn't necessarily look the same. It doesn't necessarily have the white dress, okay? It doesn't necessarily have the same, um, it may not look the same in law. But to a certain extent, I think that the, the marriage plot is, is uh, maybe more universal than we let on. And I think that that's what I'm saying. So thanks. No, I mean, I mean well, right. So what, is, what do I mean by formal so union? Me, right. So let me throw out the first question, which is for uh, Professor Rosenfeld. 
could you elaborate on what you mean by formal union? Yeah, How is so, that defined in so, so formal can be formal just at the level of the couple themselves. So they've had, you know, they've gotten together usually with their friends, and they've, uh, they've promised to be true and to stay together. And that's formal at, the, at their own level, right? And that's, that's a formal, and as I say, that's, you know, if you go back about 150 years, that was the only kind of formality there was. So, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not the way people usually define formal unions, which is recognition by the law, right? But, but there is a, there's a, a very distinctive kind of formality when two people stand in front of their friends and family and they say, you know, I'm yours and you're mine. And, and what's interesting to me is how seriously those people take it. In my data set, there's, you know, 60 or 70 uh, 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 same-sex couples who, who married long before there was you know, any talk about same-sex marriage in the United States. Those people are all together. We haven't had any breakups among those people. They take it seriously. It's formal to them. Okay, great. Um, if we have a question, well, Marianne, please. So I have a comment for um, Rosenfeld and a question slash comment for the other two. <laughs> if you go back more than 150 years, if you go back 800 years, uh, and I'm defending law and its importance, you do know that the canon law of marriage, which was the source of the English law, or the English recognition of marriage, is exactly as you describe. Two people who say to each other, I marry you, are not just married in their own eyes, not just married in the eyes of the people around them, but formally, legally, indissolubly married right. in the eyes of the church, which is the maker of marriage for the English state um, until the 18th century, well, until, until actually the 20th century, because um, went from the Catholic Church to the Anglican Church when the state took over through, anyway. So I, I yeah. Uh, the question slash comment I have for um, Melissa and Doug is, this is a panel called Alternatives to Marriage, and I find it really interesting that both of you, for reasons I know of, of the work, that, the important work that you're doing on this subject, have focused exclusively on recognition through the state, uh, as opposed to uh, contracts, like Marvin contracts, right? Which I think have also been uh, differentially impacted by, badly, by the same-sex marriage movement in legal as well as in sociological terms, the legal terms being that a lot of the mini domas made unenforceable um, uh, both same-sex and opposite-sex uh, contractual agreements, uh, which were uh, enforceable in 48 out of 50 states before all this started, the exception being uh, my current home state of Illinois and I think Georgia. Um, but, you know, or other forms of relationship um, formation that do not involve, uh, I'm not going to say state recognition, but a, a, a status with the state. Domestic partnership is a status, marriage is a status. So I'm not here being Catherine Frankie saying, uh, well, what about the alternative to marriage that is this law-free, uh, free-form state? I'm saying this is still some, and I'm not either being, um, well, to some extent, being uh, Martha Feynman saying, you know, what if there is no marriage? But an alternative to marriage that is not a status and that does not involve state recognition except through the ordinary mechanisms of law, for example. Yeah, Tim, do that. So I can say one thing, and then you probably have more to say. Um, the, the research that I've done in the project makes me um, think that some of the issues with, some of the critiques of marriage are, can be similarly lodged against recognition projects. And Catherine Frankie does make this argument, but Nancy Pollock, for instance, doesn't as much and is looking at recognition. I, I think I think that you can have the sort of normative arguments against recognition, also just a functional, practical argument against the recognition project, which is that, and I think Lee's data shows this to some extent, is the people who want recognition want marriage. And um, and so then what is what are the alternatives to recognition as opposed to alternatives to marriage? Um, and I think the contract-based ones, you know, um, same-sex couples are more likely to have formed contracts to order their relationships than different-sex couples in the absence, with the absence of recognition. I, when I teach family law and teach Marvin to my students, they know nothing about cohabitation contracts. They don't think about entering into them. Um, Lee mentioned yesterday the incentive from the 
um, banks in the Netherlands that might force people to have those conversations. Absent something like that here, I wonder whether it actually speaks to something like the ALI model being a much more viable one where once you've been together for a certain number of years cohabiting or have a child and have been together for a certain number of years, then there's rights and recognition that kick in, though I know there'd be autonomy, liberty-based objections to that model, but I don't know sort of what's the most viable. I'm not opposed to the prospect of private ordering as another form of ordering intimate relationships. Um, I think that's fine. I guess I, I'm just, I, I'm skeptical of it simply because I, I worry about the concerns about power differentials between individuals and relationships negotiating those. I worry that the idea of private ordering is simply not realistic for some populations. I mean, there. I mean, to sit down and actually make a viable contract that effectively orders the various aspects of your life, you need some degree of legal sophistication and perhaps even some counsel and assistance. And I don't know that that's necessarily something that's going to be easy for everyone who might desire some of the defaults that come with recognition. Um, I don't know if that's possible. Um, you know, maybe if you had NOLO providing sort of low cost, like private ordering mechanisms for individuals to go online and make their own will or whatever else, that's something that you might think about. But it seems like private ordering is and often has been sort of something like it's a high class option for people who have the means to do so. And I just think that there are a lot of power issues and power dynamics and access issues that are really um, difficult to deal with when private ordering is the only thing on the table or simply the predominant mode on the table. Okay, so really, you know, great, interesting, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm at the end of the day New Yorker challenge with uh, coherence here and fatigue, but I'm going to try. So, so I want to pick up on something that was actually Im embedded. I think you mentioned it. Uh, uh, each of you may have mentioned this for a moment, but I think there's another account of how domestic partnership came to look like it does and, um, uh, and raises some challenge for how it might look different in the future, and that it's the insurance story. Right, that when domestic partnership, especially early on and especially when it was sought from private employers, but also from some governments, um, a lot of the requirements that were imposed in terms of the relationship between the couple uh, were really driven by insurance companies that, which I think you mentioned, that were very concerned with adverse selection. And what you, what I, what I think, uh, so I think one of the questions then becomes when we think about the future of domestic partnership and formal positive law, non-marital recognition, is how much is it about insurance? You know, query what happens to, to health care, and how much is it about something else? Because I think that the, 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 the um, sort of adhesion of, of domestic partnership or non-marital recognition to, uh, insurance, to the uh, acquisition of insurance will limit how expansive uh, uh, its offerings are. But thinking about that, I was also struck by what I've been struck by when I read Romer, which is, uh, Romer, when I read Windsor, which is um, the marriage, so to speak, in Justice Kennedy's opinion, between the benefits of marriage and dignity. And the two are almost always mentioned together in the same sentence. And one of the things that strikes me about that in connection with domestic partnership is that some of the other early forms of domestic partnership were really about, one might say, the dignity piece or the dignity inherent of having the government recognize the unions. The sort of, you know, you get your, you get uh, nothing more from this registration than access to, you know, joint family membership at the health club, but you get some kind of recognition, recognition in that way. And so, it, so again, I think one of the questions as we think about the future of this is uh, the purpose, right? Why, why are governments offering? What benefits are people seeking from this? Why might they seek this form of recognition uh, as opposed to some others? And one last point, just historically to note, is that one of the reasons, at least when I was involved with doing some of this stuff early on, that we talked in terms of domestic partnership is because talking in terms of spousal recognition was not a complete non-starter. And so, um, the, the, you know, the term evolved partly to address some of the kinds of discomfort that came up in the conversation before around uh, the recognition of same-sex couples' relationships. And I think this, 
feeds into Melissa's point, and I think it's a very interesting question to think about now that the deep inequity between same-sex and different-sex couples is increasingly off the table with access to marriage, what does that open up in terms of re an ability to see in more in relief, in greater relief, um, the ill fit of marriage to so many people's lives? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no, no, no. Uh, so, so I, I think you're totally right. I mean, I was actually really excited to present this work to this crowd because so many of you have thought so deeply about these issues um, and could shed so much light on them. So the insurance thing is clearly right. Um, a big story is the, con the constraints imposed by insurers, not just in the private setting, but as I think you alluded to, in the government setting because a lot of the impetus for the government recognition was actually to provide something that could lead to both in, uh, benefits from public employers, but also in West Hollywood at least, something that you could take to your private employer and get your private employer to cover. And so even in the family diversity task forces, for instance, in San Francisco, so much of the reports and the testimony was about how to get insurers on board. Um, and so much of the uh, model that we end up getting is one that is about the negotiation between uh, employers and insurers on one side and couples on the other. And then the issue about recognition, I think, is a really important one, too. So in West Hollywood, it didn't really provide anything, but it was a registry. And the registry itself signified something that the mayor at the time, the discredited first openly lesbian mayor of a city uh, in the US, um, said this is a marriage of sorts to tell people that their relationship is equal in the eyes of the city. Um, and there was a, a, you know, a certificate suitable for framing. And those ideas um, suggest how important the sexual orientation equality piece and marriage access piece was even at that really early moment. And something Melissa and I have talked a little bit about is, so once marriage access, the idea of marriage access is off the table, does the idea of marriage choice, can it play a more prominent role? That's a really interesting question, I think, going forward. Um, but looking back, at least, I think the idea of marriage access was so important from the very beginning that it was really difficult to have the robust discussion about marriage choice. Um, uh, and marriage at the time, even when viewed as very radical, such that you wouldn't talk about spousal um, uh, coverage as opposed to family diversity or partner coverage, um, that idea of the marriage substitute for same-sex couples, I think, was there from the earliest iterations of domestic partnership. So just a point to add on to what Doug has said about the insurance and then to answer your last question, Suzanne. Um, so one, like, this is sort of a radical thought to sort of launch into here, but the whole question of the insurance benefits and the role of the insurance companies in shaping domestic partnership and sort of the whole idea of marriage as being the conduit to benefits really, I think, underscores and makes clear the way in which marriage has come to function as a de facto social safety net, right? So, you know, perhaps this is a moment where we can step back and sort of see that for what it is and what it's become and really think about if that's something we're going to continue or if we really will think seriously about reinvestment in public support of individuals and families. Because if, if that's the case, maybe marriage matters less for a lot of people. And, and that's something I think that ought to be on the table too. Like that's as much about alternatives to marriage as individual alternative statuses. Um, and then your last question is one that I've been thinking about. Um, what is going on here with the conferring of benefits through marriage or alternative statuses? And you know, one of the things that I've been thinking of is whether this is the kind of channeling effect that Carl Schneider talked about in that really important article in the Hofstra Law Review. And so Carl Schneider notes that the state has always had this interest in channeling individuals into marriage, and historically it did so by making marriage the only lawful place where you could have sex and procreate. And it did that by making sex outside of marriage illegal. Um, you know, for generation, for at least two generations, that's been kind of off the table. Um, in the 1950s, and certainly by the time of 2003 with Lawrence, the idea that the state could punish you criminally for having sex, private sex, seems ludicrous. And so it seems like the criminal penalties for not being in marriage have been taken off the table. So. The stick is gone, but there are all these carrots now, and it seems like everyone is talking about the carrots. So I think there's this channeling effect going on, and you know maybe we're not talking about it in the same language that Carl Schneider talked about it in, but maybe it would be illuminating to recuperate his language and think about it in that way. I want to pick up on that very sentence, uh, and that is 
But notwithstanding everything y'all have been saying, the marriage rate has actually been going down. This is not a country where um, most people are married anymore. And so I want to pick up the stuff you've been saying, Melissa. It seems to me uh, there's another way of looking at all of this, and that is that there is a competitor to marriage, and it's called cohabitation. And you all seem to be inferring that there's not a, a legal regime. And that's, I think, completely false. I think every state has some kind of legal regime that regulates cohabiting relationships, sometimes not to the knowledge of people cohabiting. Uh, most of the states have some kind of codification of Marvin. Most of the states, if the cohabiting partners have children, there's some kind of ordering that the state is ready to stand in, into and, and insist upon uh, to protect the rights of each parent to the child, in some cases, depending. Uh, the Violence Against Women Act, and I think every state, have some kind of domestic violence statute that is targeted and includes cohabiting partners. Uh, there are property arrangements. There are surrogate decision-making arrangements in some states, like the Kowalski case in Minnesota, where the cohabiting partner became the guardian and surrogate decision-maker of the incapacitated partner, et cetera. Uh, uh, even President Obama's hospital visitation rules. So I would suggest, in terms of a legal regime, there is a legal regime that already competes with marriage, and it might have more people in it, <laughs> uh, if not now, soon. Now, uh, the problem with it is the legal regime is turgid, ill thought out, and piecemeal. And that comes to my, my point. In Europe and Canada, they actually have statutes to do this. And so does Colorado. What about this as a different model? Melissa, going back to your, your point about contracting, but a state structure for contracting. Colorado designated beneficiary statute open to different sex as well as same-sex couples, uh, offers the couples a menu of options, and there are like 40 or thereabouts, of rights and duties, and they go through and they check off each one that they, that they want to include you know, in their uh, designated beneficiary thing. And so you sign up for it, you get the uh, off-the-rack legal rights and duties, and then I think it's pretty easy to get out of. I don't think you have to go through a divorce proceeding like a new civil unions, which Colorado now has, and then marriage, which it has for different sex couples. So I wonder about that as another option for the future, uh, following, as we often do in, in uh, family law pluralism, following the example of Canada and Europe. I, th I, think that's, I think the Colorado scheme is great. I, mean, I think it sort of responds to Marianne's questions and answers my questions about sort of the inequities and in private ordering by having that state structure. So I think that would be great. And I, I, one of the things that I like about it is that it truly is sort of less than and provides perhaps a spectrum of different options that individuals might elect into. So I think that would be really interesting. Um, I do think the problem, I recognize that there are these protections for cohabiting couples, but it, it does seem like they're piecemeal and very difficult. Like I think people want to sort of buy a suite. Like you know, you want the whole bedroom set. You don't want to like buy a nightstand here and a, and a bed there. You want the whole thing. I mean, that's the whole point of a legal default system. So I think that it's a very promising alternative. And it's ridiculous to litigate any of these things, <laughs> so we, which the, the common law system. And the, the other thing, so part of the story, too, about domestic partnership is, and the path to marriage, is the blurred lines between marriage and non-marriage. So the, the rights that are now, that we're starting to accrue in the cohabitation system, which is part of also Melissa's story about the um, decriminalization story of sex and then opens up this area of potential regulation in non-marital cohabitation. As the more rights and benefits you're now giving to non-marital relationships or the recognition you're giving them, even through a piecemeal fashion, sort of changes how you think about the relationship between marriage and what's not marriage, and also um, removes justifications to exclude people from marriage, because you've now given those people outside of marriage, um, in cases like Kowalski and through some statutes, rights and benefits that you think married people have too. Um, but I do think it's it's more piecemeal. Um, and um, you know the designated beneficiaries regime could be uh, have potential. Though I wonder if Lee has something about um, take up there that looks like reciprocal beneficiary. Um, but uh, that's very recent. So right, it's it's recent. And, and the other interesting thing is you don't have to even check the same thing. Both of you, you, you can pick one thing and someone else 
to not have you have that right vis-a-vis -vis them. Um, um, but it's still something that you need to go do, right? And so I guess it depends on having some mechanism to make that something that becomes more popular. Just one totally random historical memory that I have, and then one, one comment. The historical memory, Tom Brougham used to come when I was in graduate school in Berkeley in the 80s. He would come to political meetings and tell people about this great thing that had just happened in Berkeley. And I got to tell you, it was like a big ho-hum. People were not that impressed. And he got very upset about that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but look what he wrote in, in the end. But actually, I want to just make one point about the one thing that I think will probably not go away are domestic partner benefits for a couple of reasons. One is that companies still have to deal with the patchwork of laws and access to, to benefits uh, through some kind of legal relationship for same-sex couples still. And secondly, most of them include domestic, uh, different sex domestic partners as well. So there's another big pressure. And in fact, they are the ones who uh, have much higher, in contrast to the figures I showed yesterday, when you look at employer figures, it's different sex couples outnumber the same sex couples getting employment benefits by a factor of 10, roughly. So, um, so there's a there's a big demand for the employment side benefits, um, and um, in Massachusetts, uh, in the last ten years, uh, from compared to ten years ago, there are now more companies who offer domestic partner benefits. So it's not the the sort of high profile. Oh my gosh, we might take them away. Those kinds of fears, I think, were uh, are probably um, overblown. Um, it's so entrenched now in company compensation practices even though it's still a minority of companies, that the Bureau of Labor Statistics now tracks it. Um, so I think that all those things kind of suggest that these have been institutionalized. It's now, you know, insurance companies have no problem with it. Um, and uh, that actually we also owe to the Bay Area, I think, because uh, the Equal Benefits Ordinance that San Francisco passed in the mid-'90s in response to DOMA actually led to put a lot of pressure on insurance companies all across the country to offer domestic partner benefits. So there's actually, you know, the Bay Area kind of gave birth to a lot of this stuff and, and it's still continuing to flower. So I think in a lot of ways, uh, those alter those kinds of alternatives will stick around. I, I would just jump in for one quick thing to say that, um, you know, some, some of the questions sort of seem to presume that we're inches away from a regime where there's real marriage equality in the United States. And when we're there, you know, what's going to become of all these other things? But I mean, let's remember, it's a small minority of the US states that allow same-sex couples to marry. And um, it's not obvious to me that we're on the precipice of getting all the other states um, to climb on board or to get the Supreme Court to oppose it. I mean, in Loving, I think there were 33 or 34 states that had legalized interracial marriage before the Supreme Court imposed it on the whole United States. So, um, you know, I think we're going to be living with the patchwork for a long time. And let's remember that it's only a small minority of same-sex couples in the United States who even consider themselves to have formal unions who are married in states that recognize same-sex marriage. Everybody, please join me in thanking. Oh, we got a, uh, a question. <laughs>